Jesus said, Spirit of the Lord is because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. The Lord is here. I want you to put your hand on your heart if you can. Just say, come Lord, heal any broken heart in me. Bind up my broken heart. Bind up my heart, sir. Come, Holy Spirit. Set the captives free. Lord, set me free. In the name of Jesus, every addiction, every chain, Lord, let the chains just fall off. Let me hear them sound on the floor. Every bond. Freedom, he said. Lord, I pray that you would give us beauty for ashes. Lord, just, just give him your ashes and receive beauty. The oil of joy for mourning. A garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. Just put off the spirit of heaviness and take the garment of praise to our God. And he will make you a the Lord that he may be glorified in us Lord we pray for healing for Gigi right now God that's Father we pray for healing I am Murphy in the name of Jesus Lord send healing to her right now Lord, for Carlene, in the name of the Lord, that nerve that's bothering her, God, in the name of Jesus, sir, let the resurrection power of God be her portion. Lord, we pray for healing in the house and healing for all God's people. <sighs> mighty Jesus, mighty Lord, we worship you. We thank you, Lord. Bless your holy name. Lord, everywhere Ezekiel saw the river go, there was life. We didn't have to go to the river. The river came to us. Lord, I pray the river would come to us. Lord, just find us, God. Find us where we are. Find us where we are, Lord, and bring life. Lord, we say, come, river, to me. Come find me, Lord. Come on, keep coming. I'm here. Keep coming, river of God. Come, Holy Spirit. Bring life to me. Spring up, O oh well, in my soul. Out of my innermost being, let there flow rivers of your Holy Spirit. That's what you said. That's what you said. Thank you, sir. We magnify your name. We glorify your name. Thank you for coming, Lord. Thank you for being here. Heal every heart. Set every captive free. Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Worship you, Jesus. Worship you so much. Thank you so very much. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. The Lord is here. Yay. So exciting to be when God is here. The Lord is here. We just welcome you here this morning, and, and we have some great announcements. We have a, a wonderful morning for you this morning. Um, I want to remind you of two announcements quickly. One of them is 
next, this coming Wednesday, we're going to be starting our discipleship class. And uh, you're all welcome if you can make it at 7 o'clock. We'll be in the media center. That'll be, I'll be leading it. It'll be the, it's the, uh, the even, the and fourth Wednesday night. We'll, we'll try to get out within an hour. It was just a, a time of, of, of going through the word of God and the basics of, 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 of the Lord. We're going to have a, a discipleship book we're going to go through. But the beginning, we just want to launch it before then. So come if you, if you want to come. You're more than welcome. Um, if you get there late, you're also welcome. So you just come if you can. I know sometimes you can't get off work or whatever, so you're invited. Um, but the, the big announcement, and we'll have others, but the big announcement is Quiet Waters is coming. Uh, Quiet Waters is a, is a prayer and praise and celebration for God. For us to, to get, get alone and, and hear from the Lord. It'll be a Friday night service, a Friday night, and then Saturday morning from about 9 to noon, You'll be able to make an appointment to have people pray for you in the afternoon, and then we'll have a, an ending worship and pray service all here, um, and we'll be out by between 5 and 5.30 on Saturday. So it's a Friday night. It's a Saturday morning. We can come apart and, and, and hear from the Lord and worship and be quiet. Um, we'll have prayer noon, and then the ending service, and we'll be out by about 5.00. There's not going to be a bunch of preaching. It's not a preaching time where someone come preach. It's really going to be a time where we're going to invite you to come and still sort of here. It comes in and out. I'm sorry. So, so uh, it's the it's March the twenty. Wrote it down because I don't want to mess up. March the twenty second and twenty third. So if you're in town, it doesn't cost you anything. March the twenty second and twenty third. Friday night, Saturday morning, going on to the afternoon. If you can't do the whole thing, come when you, of what you can come. It'll promise you'll be blessed. And then Sunday morning, we'll continue that time of worship and waiting on the Lord. Our, our, our family, our brothers and sisters from Knoxville, at least six of them are going to come and join us. Um, Mike and Sherry Kaler, my pastor, Lori's and my pastor, they're going to come join us. You know, and also, awesome, Living Waters Community Church, Pastor Rick, Rick, they're joining us as well. So they're also going to join in worship. So it's going to be two churches together, just waiting on the Lord, hearing him. You're going to love it. And with that, watch this. Quiet Waters comes from the phrase in Psalm 23. He leads me beside quiet waters or still waters. He restores my soul. Quiet Waters is a, is a prayer and a worship retreat. It's a time for us to come aside, to unplug, to decompress, and to take time to hear God's voice, take time to worship Him, and to hear relevant teaching. It's not a teaching conference. It's a quiet conference to come and, and come beside Quiet Waters and hear from the Lord. This is a time for you and I to get together, to get quiet, and to hear what God has to say to us. First time that I went to Quiet Waters was last year, and that was the first time I've ever been to Quiet Waters, and I didn't really know what to expect, but um, I have to say that I've been looking forward to this next year, ever since I was there. Um, I was really encouraged by uh, just spending time alone with the Lord and, and hearing his voice and just um, getting quiet. Uh, one of the things that I know that we all do is we just stay busy all the time and it's hard for us to just stop and spend time with the Lord. But I just want to encourage you that you'll really be blessed if you set aside this time to go and to receive the word, receive, um, hear the Lord's voice and also from other people. They have prophetic teams that encourage, exhort, and edify, and they will give you words, and it will bring life to you, and it will speak to you, and it will change your life. So I just want to encourage you to come out. You will not regret setting aside this time to spend with the Lord. So good morning, everybody. Uh, we're so thankful that you're here this morning. Uh, those that are watching us online, we're all so thankful. We know that you can be anywhere else. But I'm so excited this morning because um, this has been a little bit in the making. 
Um, so I have uh, a personal joy to introduce a special guest today, uh, a friend of mine, my Jewish brother in the faith of Yeshua, Jesus, uh, Greg Savitt with Chosen People Ministries, and he's going to share to us uh, a special uh, sermon this morning. So welcome here, uh, Greg Savitt. The songs we sang this morning reminded me of something I read this morning in Biblical uh, Archaeology Review. Uh, do you realize that Jesus was not allowed to go into Jerusalem and all the jewelry stores? Because they were afraid he would break all the chains. All right, that was bad. <laughs> I thought I would tie that in. Well, my name is Greg Savitt. I'm a missionary to the Jewish people. Uh, I work with Chosen People Ministries. I am 100% Jewish. I'm 100% Christian. I get all the holidays off, which is great. Uh, I've been 21 years in Jewish evangelism and 27 years in believer, as a believer. I work for Chosen People Ministries, and um, I hope you can go outside and fill out a little form be, to get our newsletter, because you'll get a free book of our founder, Leopold Cohn. And it's a really interesting story. Okay, I'll try to twist it here. Rabbi Leopold Cohen was a uh, rabbi in Hungary, and he was searching for truth, and he started to realize that maybe the Messiah came already. So he was asking all of his friends, and they were joking with him, and they said, well, why don't you go to New York? You know, if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. You know, if you're looking for something. So this guy goes on a three-week boat ride. You know, he did take a plane. Thank you, Pastor. And uh, he's walking in the Holy Land, Brooklyn, and he looks, he looks to the right, and he sees a Jewish star. And he says, wow, that's kosher. I'll go into it. The guy barely understands English at all. But what are the odds that in that service, it was a messianic service in Yiddish? He radically became born again. He brought his family over. And 125 years later, uh, chosen people are still going strong. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but South Florida is the second largest Jewish population in the United States. Did you know that? 750,000 Jewish people live in Broward, uh, Palm Beach, and, and Dade. And when I first came down here, I went to Walmart. I thought I was back in Hebrew school. I mean, it was a lot of Jewish people. And I want to encourage you that most Jewish people, um, most Jewish people, you know, don't believe in Jesus. But I want to give you a quote that's very encouraging. More Jewish people today, in 2018, that are Jewish believe in Jesus than the last 2018 years. So you Gentiles are doing a good job. I guess we're doing a good job. Uh, my message this morning is, why do Jewish people need Jesus? And how to witness to them. Now, I'm not a high-tech guy with PowerPoint and stuff, so I hope you brought your Bibles. If you want to use your phones, I don't care. Uh, we're going to look over certain texts. Some texts I'm going to do really quickly. You don't have to look at it, but uh, basically I'm going to be in the book of Romans. Why should we reach Jewish people? You guys know that Jesus was Jewish, right? You know, I thought he was first born. I thought Mary and Joseph Christ had a son named Jesus. I didn't even know that meant Messiah. But uh, Jesus said to go to the Jewish people. In Matthew 15:24. Jesus said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Next scripture is Luke 19.41. Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, and he wept over it. If only you had known on this day you would, what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Savior, King, and Lord, is crying over Jerusalem if only they were willing. Now, we're going to share my favorite scripture. You could probably look it up if you want. You probably heard it. It's Romans 1, 1 verse 16. When I say it, you guys have heard it. Paul says in Romans 1 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Now, did you notice that Paul didn't put a period there? 
he says, first for the Jew and also the Gentile. One of my favorite commentaries, France, France de Leach, he is an Old Testament scholar. He said, for the church to evangelize the world without thinking of the Jews is like a bird trying to fly when one broken wing. If any person was ashamed of the gospel who was not ashamed of the gospel, that would have been the Apostle Paul. You want to look at his resume real quick with me? He was imprisoned in Philippi, chased out of Thessalonica, smuggled out of Berea, laughed at in Athens, regarded as fool in Corinth, and stoned in Galatia. Now, I've been in Jewish many 21 years. I've been hit with umbrellas. I've been spit on. I've been hit. My tracks have been ripped up. Uh, Jewish people have tried to hit me. But Paul went through a lot worse. And I want to encourage you guys, if you witness the Jewish people, you're not going to get beat up like me, okay? Yeah, you know what? They'll be very interested in what, you, what you're saying. Um, I want to share something controversial, and I can do that because I'm going to leave in an hour. One pastor once said to me, the most anti-Semitic thing that a Christian can ever do to a Jewish person is to not share the gospel with them. Think about this. If we really believe that if you don't know Jesus, you're eternally separate from God and you're going to spend all eternity in misery, that's the worst thing you can do than not to share the gospel with the Jewish people. Now, it's interesting. There's a, there's a saying, you know, if you have two Jews... You have three opinions. And there's a lot of opinions on the afterlife. Some say, you know, uh, we, you know, we should believe in it. Others say that we shouldn't. But it's interesting, in Daniel, I want to read this verse to you. And tell me if you think this sounds like heaven and hell. Because I think it does. Daniel 12, 2. Many of those who sleep in the ground, in the dust of the ground, will wake. Those to everlasting life but others to everlasting disgrace and, and contempt. So you have people that are sleeping, you know, meaning death. One goes to everlasting righteousness. One goes to uh, eternal of disrespect. That sounds like heaven and hell. You want some more examples? How about King David? He said, may they, in Psalm, Psalm 69, 28, may they be blotted out of the book of life and may they not be recorded with the righteous. Jewish people in the scriptures have a notion there's a book of life. And if there's a book of life, there's the book of death. You guys know all about Yom Kippur? Jewish people, we fast for 25 hours. We beat our chest with, our, with all of our transgression. The last hour, the rabbis really make it hard. You stand up. You got bad breath. Your stomach is, is churning. You're all sweaty because you had to walk to temple that morning. And does that give you eternal life? They're all worrying about it. So Jewish people have a notion of eternal life. Um, I'm not worried about that. And I'll let you know why. Because in 2 Corinthians 5.21, he who was not sin became sin. So the righteousness of God is in us through him. Guys, that is good news. That is great news. That is the gospel. He takes the sin that we deserve, and we get the righteousness of life. Now, it's interesting that Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles, uh, but he makes that statement to the Jew first. I just want to give a little bit of Paul's uh, history. He is from the tribe of Benjamin, and that's significant because Benjamin and Judah were in the southern tribe uh, so they were the last holdout. So they're, they're not like the Israel kingdom. They were all, you know, murdering children, and, and you had all these high poles, and they're worshiping uh, pagan gods, but not Benjamin and also Judah. Did you know that Paul studied under Rabbi Gamaliel, one of the greatest rabbis in the last 2,000 years? Paul had zeal. This guy had chutzpah, Jewish for guts, he wanted to kill all the Christians. That had zeal. He was a Pharisee among the Pharisees. He was the Orthodox Jew among Orthodox Jew. Some scholars believe this, and this is interesting. They think Paul either was a member of the Sanhedrin or he was going to be a member of the Sanhedrin. 
And he would, Paul was like on the fast track. Paul was the rising star in Judaism. And the Sanhedrin, it was the most powerful political body in Judaism. It was like the Supreme Court, the Congress, and the executive all rolled up in one. And a lot of people believe that he was on the Sanhedrin. Also, did you know that he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament? That's not bad to have on your resume. Paul was brilliant from Rome. He was a tremendous debater. He met Jesus personally. He was discipled by Peter, Paul, and James. Wow, I'd like to be on that Bible study. Pretty amazing. Romans has been said, and I agree with this, you might disagree, is the most significant theological letter ever written in the scriptures. The book is so powerful that it influenced these people's salvations. Augustine, Martin Luther, and John Wesley. These are just pretty powerful men of the faith. Um, Paul was a Gentile, was a Jewish person, the apostle of Gentiles, but he was first reaching the Jewish people. And you know what happens when you preach to a lot of uh, uh, Jewish people first? I've done this for 21 years. A lot of Gentiles here. When I'm out handing out tracts, I don't know why, but I've led more Gentiles to the Lord than Jewish ones. Maybe there's a lot more of you than, than Jews. Also, I've been on the street corner handing out gospel tracts, and, I, and I've heard Christians come up to me and says, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm sharing the gospel. They're like, you're Jewish. I said, yeah, I'm a Jewish believer. And they're like, why aren't we doing this? You provoke them to jealousy. Now, Paul, when Paul went to town, he was, remember, he's apostle Gentile. Uh, did he stop first at the first Baptist church of Corinth when he came into town? No, he went to a synagogue. Usually there was a revival, sometimes there was a riot, and sometimes it was both. Now, why did he go to the synagogue? Because he believed in Romans 1.16. Not to be ashamed of the gospel, but go first to the Jew and then the Gentile. Now, I want to talk with you something called it's in the church now. It's called replacement theology. I know your church. I know your pastors. I know they don't believe in it. But I wanted to bring this up because it is a trend among some Christians. And basically, they say, you know, Israel, don't worry about it. The church has replaced Israel. All the promises to Jesus and the Davidic kingdom and the prophets, that all now goes to Israel. And what they do is they take a lot of all those promises and they allegorize them to the church. But is this true to the word of God? Let's see what Paul says in Romans 11, verse 31. Did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people. So God is saying to Paul that he has not rejected his Jewish people. Um, there's basically a couple reasons why I don't believe in replacement theology. Uh, the first one is if you take away, if you, if you believe that the church has replaced Israel and the Jewish people are really nowhere, nowhere on the radio screen, who's going to reach the Jewish people? Who's going to witness to the Jewish people? Who's going to care about the nation of Israel? When you make the church Israel, you don't have a need for Jewish evangelism. I'd be out of a job. Who would care about Jewish people coming to faith? Also, I'm going to show you in one passage is that a lot of the times they say it's an allegory. We can make this a church. It doesn't work because if you look at the scripture, you'll see it's clearly talking about Jesus, Israel, end times, and the Bible. Um, I want you to look at Isaiah 2, verse 3 through 4. I'm going to read it to you if you don't have your Bibles, but... This is a passage that they, replacement theology will allegorize. They'll make metaphors. Oh, that's not really talking about that. That's talking about the church, and that's why they do this with a lot of passages. But look at this. Verse 3. Many people will come up and say, let us go up to the Mount of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. So we got a lot of people. They're going up to the temple, the Mount of Jacob. That's Jerusalem. 
He will teach us his ways. Who's he? He is Jesus who has come in power and glory, and he's coming back on the Mount of Olives, and he is now reigning as our king. And it says, he will walk in his past. The law will call forth from Zion, from the word of the Lord, from Jerusalem. The word of the Lord really is just means the Lord. So this he, this person who's directing the people's path, the word of God, God's word is going forth because Jesus is reigning in Jerusalem on the mountains. Now it gets really interesting. Verse 4, he, who's that he? I'm all in on Jesus, guys. You know those poker games on TV or movies when like, I'm all in. I'm all in that this is talking about Jesus. Uh, it says, he will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many people. Jesus is going to be the judge. Do you think there are going to be mistrials? Do you ever think there will be appeals? No. We will have perfect justice through the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Now, this next sentence I'm going to share with you, and it's going to be familiar because if you've ever gone to New York City, this is what's on the United Nations building. Yeah, United Nations. It says, they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations will not take up sword against nations, nor will they war anymore. And you can see why that is on the United Nations. Now, a lot of Jewish people are like, well, the Messiah has to bring peace on earth. Yeah, he's going to bring peace on earth, but when he comes again, that's when he'll establish peace and justice. Uh, the first time he came for salvation, the second time he's coming for, uh, for judgment. Now, I could go a bunch of these examples, but I don't want to bore you with a bunch of uh, uh, scripture that really should be taken literally. But the third reason why I don't believe in replacement theology has six million parts. And those six million parts are the people in Israel. How can you have replacement theology when you have six million Jews living right now in the land of Israel? I think that's pretty incredible that in 1939 through 1945, six million Jewish people were killed and exterminated. But today we have six million Jewish people in Israel. Can I get a hallelujah? That's pretty amazing. God is so good. So how can you be replacement theology if you actually have Israel? Okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on. Um, I want to share a scripture with you guys that show, do you know that you guys benefited for us Jewish people rejecting the Messiah? You got good stuff, okay? Uh, Romans 11, verse 12. Now, if their transgressions is riches for the world... Guess what? You're the world and you got the riches because Jewish people pushed back and had their transgression. It says, and their failure is riches for the Gentile. How much more will the fulfillment be? For if their rejection is the reconcile of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If, if the rejection of the Jewish people brought you guys in, what will it mean when Jewish people in massive force come to believers? It will be life from the dead. There will be nothing more powerful than these Jewish people that come to faith now and in the end times. It is life from the dead. The dead. And when I was a Jewish person, I got saved. I was on fire because I knew the first sequel, the Old Testament, but now I had the, se now I had the second part. And I already had the first part in me, and I was just massively on fire for the Lord. Um, okay, now I want to give you some tips on evangelism to Jewish people. Now, I cannot give you in the next 15 minutes everything you need to know about Jewish people, but I'm going to give you enough to start a conversation to have a conversation with your Jewish person. Because remember, you guys lead Jewish people to the Lord, 75% more than I do. You know what happens? It's like, do you ever see Star Trek when Captain Kirk says, Scotty, shields up. That's what happens when I witness the Jewish people sometimes. Because I'm Jewish, and they're Jewish, and they're like, wait a second, this is not right. But when you guys witness, they'll be like, oh, really, Robert? That sounds interesting. Tell me more. First thing I want you to let you know. Jewish people do not know the Bible inside and out. You might say, oh, they're the people of the book. Oh, they're Jewish. They must know the Old Testament. How could I possibly witness to them? Wrong, wrong, wrong. You guys, and I'm talking to everybody here today, 
90% of you know more about Judaism than Jewish people by your faith in the Bible. Jewish people don't read the Bible. Uh, I believe that most Jewish people get their theology from Fiddler on the Roof. They really don't know anything. Um, also, if you ever get a Jewish person, this is such an easy way to witness, guys, and it gets an account. Ask them questions. Oh, so you're Jewish. Do you believe the Messiah is coming, or is he going to come later? How do you get into heaven and hell? I was going to ask you how your sins are forgiven, because I was reading the Bible. You know, the temple's been destroyed for like 1,944 years. I'm just curious how you do that. And you know what? This easy asking questions, it's a great way to get into a dialogue. If you go to your Jewish person and take your Bible and like crack him on his head and say, uh, John 3.16 says this, you're not going to get very far. But you know what? You need to ask them questions. Um, also, don't talk Christianese. What is Christianese? I will tell you. In 1991, I sat in a Lutheran church. They said, stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, read this, do this, justification, sanctification, born of the Lamb, born again. What's going on? I knew nothing. But you know what? Talked about Jewish people, Redeemer, Messiah, Savior, Atonement. Stick with stuff that we know, okay, that relates to them. Also, let the Jewish person know that, you know, you could be Jewish and believe in Jesus. Do you know that every book in the Bible and the New Testament was written by somebody who was Jewish? With the possible exception of Luke, and here's my theory, he's a doctor. So I'm really thinking he's got a good chance to be Jewish. Come on, this is South Florida. You gotta get... When I tell this joke in Alabama, nobody gets it, but you guys... Um, let them know they'll always be Jewish. Let them know that there's Jewish Buddhists. Did you know that? And they're accepted by the Jewish community. There's Jewish Hare Krishnas accepted by the Jewish community. You know what's sad? There's Jewish atheists, and they're accepted by the Jewish community. But you know what? The moment you're Jewish and you believe in Jesus, that is a stumbling block sometimes. I was on an airplane once, this old Jewish couple... We were talking. They loved me. They said they wanted to babysit my kids, invite me to Shabbat. And then they said, Greg, what do you do for a living? I said, well, uh, you really want to, don't want to know. They go, is it immoral? I said, no, it's not immoral. Well, tell us. We're very liberal. We understand. And I said, I'm a missionary of Jewish people. I stand before the Lord for the next 30 minutes. They didn't talk to me. They didn't even say goodbye. You know, it was a stumbling block right there. Um, how do you know if your Jewish friend is not uh, open to the gospel? You might think that a Jewish person that's very with their hands and they raise their voice, that they're not mad at you. They're really not. They, you know, there's a saying, you know, Jewish people are just like everybody else, only more so. <laughs> and when we talk, you know, with our hands and we get, we're not, sometimes we're not mad. You know, look at the Apostle Paul. He was saved when he was angry. He wanted to kill Christians. And I'll tell you this. I would rather talk to, talk to a Jewish person who's orthodox and angry than a person who says, I don't care. You can't get anywhere with those guys. Yeah, it's all good, whatever, I don't care. You can't get anywhere. But if somebody's against it, that's not such a bad thing. Also, make Jewish people jealous. Um, it says... Romans 11, 11, I said, do they not stumble so as the fall did they? May it never be. However, by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. You make them jealous by knowing about the Bible. When you know about the Bible, you know the Jewish holidays. You'll ask them questions. And this happens like, like 100 times a year that I talk to people. Jewish people are like, how do you know so much about Judaism? You're a goy. You're a Gentile. How do you know that? It's because you know the Bible. And also, you can, you can bring people to jealousy by the Holy Spirit in your heart, how you react to them. I first had this when I was uh, 13 years old, and there was this girl in high school in, in, when I was in my class. Her name was Amy Penny. She was blonde. She was gorgeous. She controlled the school. She had a little, little, little cadre of people that followed her. She was mean. I mean, she didn't talk to anybody. She ruled that place. And that summer, she worked in a pizza store, and she got her, um, her hand caught in a sausage grinder. 
and it like took off her hand. And me and my friends were like, oh my gosh, she is so horrible before, she's going to be unbearable. I'll always forget that first morning at South Junior High School, she walked in with a glow on her face, smiling with a black Bible where her hand wasn't there anymore. And she was nice, and she was kind, and she was sweet. And you know what? I didn't connect everything together, guys, but I knew something happened through God that changed this girl. She became, uh, uh, let's see, queen, uh, what is that, queen of the prom, prom yeah, queen. Yeah, so anyways, that's a you know, way to show them by their jealousy. Um, if you are afraid, that's okay. The devil's against you. The devil doesn't want you to witness to Jewish people or Gentiles. Uh, if you're emotionally, if, um, so if you're emotionally afraid as well, and also physically afraid, that's okay. You just have to overcome it. When I used to go out to do evangelism in South Beach, I used to call it Sodom and Gomorrah, and then I'd be in my car and I'd be driving there by myself, and I would see like a, a cloud, like a dark cloud, and I'd be like, "Well, it's gonna rain." I might as well go back. Why should I go there? It's going to rain. And I, you know, I had all these battles going on with me because it's a spiritual battle. Um, Romans 9, verse 3. Or I could wish myself cursed and cut off for Christ for the sake of my people. That's Paul saying he wants, he'll go to hell for the Jewish people to get saved. I mean, that's pretty incredible. You know, I might do that for my family, I might do that for close friends, but I'm not doing that for Mr. and Mrs. Ginsburg, who I don't even know. I mean, that's amazing. And think about this, guys. If Paul loved Jewish people so much that he was willing to go to hell for him, how much more does God love us as well? That God wants none of us to perish um, Paul was concerned with the lost sheep of Israel. He wanted all people to be saved. Now, evangelism is, different, is difficult. I'll be honest with you. I've had times when I've gone to church and I'm, I'm going to bring people out in the streets and do Jewish evangelism. I'll get five people. But if I had a potluck, I'd get 75 people. And you know I'm right. Nobody wants to do Jewish evangelism. Why? It's hard. You're spiritually attacked by the devil, you're emotionally attacked with people, and you're physically challenged. Um, you know, who wants to deal with an atheist that has all these difficult questions? You know, who wants to deal with a, somebody that doesn't care? Who wants to see somebody that says, uh, you know, all these lies, that Christians are hypocrites and all, and comes up with everything under the sun, and you try to explain it to them, and they just argue again and again and again. That's when I know when to stop. If you remember anything, if you're ever talking to somebody and you're bringing up an argument and they say, yeah, but what about this? And then you answer that objection and they say, what about that? That person's not listening. You need to like somehow uh, cut it off. Um, you're going to get crazy answers sometimes. People have the nuttiest things to say. And how do you answer this? I mean, how would you? I got this question once and he was serious. This Jewish guy said, Jesus' disciples saw the risen Christ because they were all stoned on shrooms. What? I mean, what evidence does this guy have? How do I argue with this guy? I mean, so sometimes you're going to get, you know, really weird questions. But do not be afraid. Uh, and if you ever have a chance and you have a Jewish person or a Gentile, get out your Bibles and ask them to read aloud the Scripture. Say, please read this. When you do that and you say, well, what does the text say? And they say, well, I think this and this. And you know, No, 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 no. What is that text saying? And guys, when you get the Bible and the person involved, you've won a big battle. You know what that is? It's the battle is between the word of God and the person. I'm going to bet on the word of God. So get them to do that, to witness. Um, uh, my favorite is Isaiah 53. Uh, if you have one chance with a person, read Isaiah 53. Jewish people never hear that in the synagogue because the rabbis are afraid. It sounds too much like Jesus. 
though they don't read Isaiah 53. But, uh, you know, in the New Testament, there are 302 Old Testament quotes and 631 allusions. So there's a lot of evidence of why we should bring the gospel to Jewish people. And, uh, you know, if you want to come out there and um, sign up, and I could uh, email you if you want some tips on how to witness to Jewish people. I've been doing 21 years. You know, there's no, there's no, there's no ABC and, and salvation happens. There's been times I've gone to a Jewish man. I have just been the Johnny Kirk. Cochran of Jewish evangelism, I just lit up a 30-minute uh, dialogue where I had points and counterpoints, and I brought in, you know, uh, Old Testament theology and rabbinical theology, and, I, and at the end, the person says, I don't get it. And there's times where I've gone in and just say to a Jewish man, would you like to have your sins forgiven? Would you like to have God in your heart? And sometimes they say, Yes. You never know. It's like, have you guys ever bought a car at a, at a, at a car place? Have you, anybody? Okay. Now, when you buy a car, you got the sales manager there, and you say to the sales manager, I want $1,000 off. What does the sales guy do? Let me talk to my manager. Who's the manager? We never see him. We never hear from him. And the manager comes out and says, okay, $500. And you're like, well, I want a lifetime supply of oil changes. And the salesman says, let me talk to my manager. Who's the manager? Some secret guy in the back that makes the deal. And you know what? We're the salesman, guys. We're just there to plant seeds. You know what? I'm just a Jewish farmer. I plant seeds. And I can't tell you how many times in my ministry that I have did a Bible study with somebody, and I shared scripture, and they're Jewish, and I just walked off saying, that's a disaster. I'll never hear from that person again. And then five years later, I got a call from a woman who said, you remember Lloyd that you shared the gospel with in Weston? I said, yeah, I remember him. Uh, he was very angry at me. Well, she said, something that you said stuck into his heart, and he prayed to receive the Lord like five years later. So you never know. You know, plant seeds. You know, you guys know Jewish doctors and lawyers and neighbors and acquaintances and coworkers. You can be gently talking to them about Jesus. I have some free stuff and some not so free stuff. Uh, for my free stuff, uh, all you can do is just take these pamphlets and say to your Jewish friend, "This is about the. This is about Judaism." And I would like to know if you could help me understand it because you're Jewish, you're, you're a lot smarter than me, I'm just a Gentile. Maybe you can help me with this. And if you get them to interact with the, with the tract, you have a good chance to talk with them. I'm going to close with one of my favorite quotes, and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Chosen People Ministries. Um, this is a beautiful story about a relationship with John Wilkinson. He's a Gentile missionary. He founded the Mid-May Mission of the Jews. So uh, John Wilkinson had a Jewish ministry. And Hudson Taylor, have you heard of Hudson Taylor? Some have, yeah. Founder of the Chilean Inland Mission, now OMF. Every January, Taylor would send Wilkinson a check for a sum of money that said to the Jew first. And every January, Wilkinson would send the same amount back to Taylor, which read, and also to the Gentile. We can prioritize reaching Jewish people because of God's choice in Abraham's seed according to the flesh. It really begins with you, through prayer, giving, and witnessing to your Jewish friend, making them jealous, the plan of God to come forth. Guys, we cannot make the Great Commission the great omission to Jewish people. This is beginning to change, and some churches, like yours, are taking Jewish evangelism more seriously than ever before, and I hope it continues. Now, I'd like for you guys to stand with me in my ministry. Uh, I have a sign-up sheet out there if you'd like to get our newsletter. You'll love our newsletter. It's got the Jewish roots of our Christian faith. It has my personal prayer letter, uh, what's happening in Israel. And you're going to get the truth on that. i got news for you. CNN is not telling you the truth, what's happening in Israel. Uh, and so you sign up and get that. You'll, free, you'll be a free book. Uh, also, I have some books this morning um, that I want to talk about. This is a great 
resource, how to witness the Jewish people. It's called You Bring the ba- Bagels, I'll Bring the Gospel. And it's a funny book, but it's how to you know, reach Jewish people. This is one of my favorite books on the nation of Israel. Whose land is it? Where do the Jewish people come from? Where do the Palestinians come from? What are the end time plans for the Jewish people in this book? And also the things that are going on to today. And um, this is the book that you get if you fill out this card. It's called To an Ancient People. We'll send it to you. This is the story about Leopold Cohen, how he radically comes to faith. This is very encouraging. Um, This is used in a lot of mission classes and seminaries. It's a very powerful book. Finally, this is my favorite book, From Tradition to Eternity, from Greg Savitt. I got my bucket list off. I wrote a book. This has my testimony, my 21 years of evangelism, some amazing stories, messianic prophecy, and I'll sign it for you because someday if I get famous, you could put it on eBay, you know? <laughs> I'm just giving you an offer here. Um, but I'm just so glad that you come. I hope that you could stop by my table, and if you ever need help witnessing Jewish people, uh, that would be great. And just know that, um, in that bo- I'll have a box out there And if you feel led to give to Chosen People Ministries, you can give out a check to Chosen People Ministries. If you'd like to give cash, uh, um, if you want to give a credit card to see it, I have a card that you can fill out. But the money that you give is going to go 90% to Jewish people hearing the gospel. It'll go towards tracts that we hand out. It's going to go for um, this Isaiah, these books that we hand out. And we have a really big job. I'm the director of follow-up in the United States. And last year, because of our efforts on social media, we have 10,000 Jewish people who want to know more about Jesus. So it's like, oy vey, praise the, God, praise the Lord, you know? It's like, this is unbelievable. So um, please pray for me as I you know, get these contacts and follow up with them because these are people that need the Lord. So... Um, that's all I had to say. I'm so appreciative to come to Two Rivers and Pastor Roberts Squared. Can I say that? The double Roberts there. Uh, it was a really, really blessing. And um, thank you for letting me come and share. God bless you guys. You want to pray for him? Reach out your hand. Let's pray for him. God bless you, brother. Thank you so much. Father, Lord, thank you for my brother. Lord, I pray for the blessing of the Lord, the favor of God to be upon him and his ministry. Lord, your favor and your grace. Let the favor of the Lord and your grace be upon his ministry. Lord, I ask for the power of the Holy Spirit to overwhelm the people he speaks so they would hear the good news. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We bless him and chosen people of ministries, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. We wanted him to come. You know, we live in a huge population of our Jewish friends, and we wanted us to have hope and encouragement to know how to reach out to people in our community that we interact with all the time to learn how to share the gospel. And so thank you so very much. God bless you all. We're going to be dismissed, but before we do, I need to do two things. One, I want to pray over our offering. And two, we're going to be here up front, pray for anyone that would like prayer for anything. But I'm I'm so glad that you, you were here this morning. I'm excited about the opportunity for us to be sensitive to the Lord as we just interact with people and plant seeds. I'm so glad that you and I are not the Holy Spirit. Yay, yay God. We're seed, we're farmers. We're seed planters. We're seed planters and God gives the increase. Holy Spirit does his work. So that's just a a wonderful thing. Let's pray together. We'll be dismissed after my prayer and then here if you you wanna be prayed for anything, Come on and, 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 and uh, join us. We'll be waiting. Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for this morning. God, give me wisdom and opportunity to share the good news, Lord. Lord, I thank you for the gifts of your people. I thank you for the investment into the kingdom. And Lord, I pray for the blessing of the Lord.
to be upon your people, upon their finances, Lord, upon their jobs, Lord. Help us to pay our bills, Lord, and have extra to give and to share and to help. Lord, I thank you very much. We bless you. I thank you that your people are blessed. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you all. Come on up if you need prayer, but otherwise y'all have a great, great time. I think we've got even some food outside, so uh, be prepared to eat. So come on. Thank you.